afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our third series of webinars of the Food for Sustainability Academy. So today our session is dedicated to understanding and know more about sustainable agriculture and how can it be carbon neutral. To, to start this session, we have invited three experts, which we truly thank for your support and availability to join us today, and uh, also to share your knowledge and views on the topic of reducing uh, greenhouse gases emission from ruminants and working towards a carbon neutral farming practice. So I have the pleasure to be joined by Professor Diwakar Vias, an expert in livestock production and nutritional management. Welcome, Professor Diwakar. I also I have with me Professor José Dubo, a specialist also in agronomy and sustainable livestock production. It's a pleasure to have you here. And finally, I welcome Manuel Lainez. Uh, he's a specialist in agri-food research and innovation. So I will be moderating this session. My name is Daniela Fonseca. I'm a PhD in sustainable chemistry and a product valorization specialist at Food for Sustainability. And I'm also part of the Food for Sustainability Academy team, which is our learning hub dedicated to educational awareness raising and also capacity building programs towards achieving Food for Sustainability mission on working towards the sustainable intensification of the agri-food system towards a good health and well-being. So just to frame our conversation here today, let me remind you that Food for Sustainability has a well-defined research agenda, which covers the topics of circular economy, sustainable farming, territorial development through the promotion of ecosystem services, and also functional nutrition. With this mission in mind, livestock management is a crucial piece in sustainable farming systems, carbon mitigation, and also more nutrient-rich food. So to bring this webinar to you, we have a dedicated team that I would like to thank and also want to acknowledge the outstanding work of Claudia Costa, and uh, she's the Food for Sustainability Academy coordinator. And also I would like to thank to Sylvia because together with uh, Professor Claudia, they are not available to join us today. But here with us, we have Margarida Palma, our PhD in microbiology. Hello, Margarida. And Rita Silva, our, our master's in microbiology. And last but not least, I would like to acknowledge the dissemination support from BGI Building Global Innovators. Thank you all for making this session possible. And just before we start, I will share some house rules and how uh, we will run this session. So let me remind you that we record the Food for Sustainability um, webinars for later viewing. So if you are not comfortable in appearing, I kindly ask you to remain with your cameras off. Also, the session is more interesting if we can have your questions. So we are definitely welcoming your questions and your opportunity to clarify anything that you want. Uh, all of these questions will be posted through Slido after each speaker's presentation, and I will have the opportunity to address them. Each speaker will, each speaker will have uh, 15 minutes to present, and we will allow for uh, 5 to 10 minutes of Q&A after each presentation. But before we start presentations from our speakers, we have prepared a few questions for you just as a warm up and to start introducing the topic. And we will be using Slido for that. Thank you, Rita. Here um, you will have a QR code that you can scan with your phone or just join in through www.slido.com and insert uh, F4S Academy in the hashtag box. And I will give you just a couple of seconds for you to join uh, Slido and then we will start. We will have three questions um, that will give us an highlight of the big picture of uh, today's topic. Let's see if we have already uh, someone logged in, uh, Rita. Probably we can check that. Just wait a couple more. 
participants, a couple more seconds for participants to join in. I remind you to go into uh, slido.com and start typing in your questions. So the first question is, livestock production generates how much gross domestic product? Is it 37%, 40% or is it 51%? What is your opinion? So I see that we have uh, a winner, uh, but I'm checking in and I'm seeing that we have more people uh, still joining in Slido. So for all of you, literature has shown that nearly 40% of the global agricultural gross domestic product is the right answer. So we have a winner and to add up, livestock provi provide 33% of the global protein and 70% of the global calories consum consumed. So production creates substantial employment opportunities also for rural and industrial households. So now we move to question number two. Let's see what we have in here. Thank you, Rita. So enteric, the question is, enteric fermentation from ruminants is the largest anthropogenic source of methane emissions in the US. Data from 2020 indicates the production of how much CO2 from enteric fermentation. Are we talking about 120 million tons of CO2 equivalents? Uh, is it 175.2 or are we expecting a higher value of uh, 201 millions? You can now select your answer. And we have a tie. Actually, this is not a consensual answer, but the right question is enteric fermentation from ruminants accounts uh, for uh, 175.2 million tons of CO2 equivalent, representing about 27% of total uh, methane emissions. And now for the last questions, for the last question. So this is a question that probably Professor Diwakar can uh, answer. Using methane inhibitor 3 nitro oxypro Propanol um, is a promising mitigation strategy because it has been shown to decrease methane emissions when supplemented to high forage up to 40%, 60 or 80. And we have our questions coming in. Let's check what the audience is saying. So we clearly have a winner in here. This data was collected from one of the papers of Professor Diwa Carvias, who is with us today, and the right question is 40%. This is a consensual answer, fantastic. It shows that the, the, the audience is knowledgeable of the topic. Thank you so much for joining in and to taking part of this quiz. I hope this has opened your appetite to learn a little bit more about this topic. Um, just to remind you that Slido will be open through the webinar, so you can write down your questions um, and we will address them to the speakers at the end of uh, each one of the presentations. And now let me introduce you uh, our lovely speakers. So in this webinar on can sustainable agriculture be carbon neutral, we will first have Professor Diwakar Vias an assistant professor in the Department of Animal Sciences at the University of Florida. Um, he earned his PhD from the University of Maryland in dairy cattle nutrition and completed a postdoctoral fellowship um, working in areas of environmental sustainability and rumen physiology of the beef production systems. His research program focuses on optimizing nutritional management to improve production efficiency of nutrient use and environmental sustainability of livestock production with emphasis on dairy cows and small ruminants. Today, Professor Diwakar will talk about reducing livestock methane emissions and carbon footprint with uh, feed additives and will talk about implications for a sustainable agriculture. Next, 
we will have Professor José de Bo. He's natural from Brazil and he's currently a professor at the University of Florida. The major focus of his research program is to develop sustainable livestock production systems, namely in nutrient cycling in grazed ecosystems and sustainable intensification of livestock. His research also includes integration of forage legumes into livestock systems, integrated crop and livestock systems, and grazing management using stockpiled forages to extend grazing season. And Professor José Dubo will kick off today's webinar with a presentation on sustainable intensification of beef cattle production. And last but not least, we will have um, Manuel Lainez. He's a graduate in veterinary medicine from the University of Zaragoza with an extraordinary end of career award and holds a PhD in agronomy from the Polytechnic University of Valencia. His main activities were always connected with agricultural research and animal technology. And he is currently working as an independent consultant in agri-food research and innovation, collaborating with Spanish meat uh, professionals, especially in the beef cattle. Manuel Lenis will finish today's webinar. It will close it with a talk about Spanish beef cattle interprofessional code of good practices. So um, I open the floor to Professor Diwakar with uh, a presentation called Reducing Livestock Methane Emissions and Carbon Footprint with Feed Additives. The floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Diwakar. Thank you very much, Daniela. Can you hear me well? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, before I start my presentation, I share my slide. I would like to uh, thank uh, the organizing committee of Food for Sustainability program that they've invited me, um, given me this chance to interact with uh, all the attendees and share some of the research that I have done on sustainability. So I hope uh, I'll be able to give some feedback uh, some based on my research background in this area. So I'm trying to share my screen now. I hope you all can see my PowerPoint yes. slide in a full screen mode. Yes, yes, it is in full screen mode. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, as Daniela mentioned, um, I have uh, done some work on environmental sustainability uh, that is focused on how we can use feed additives for reducing methane emissions from the ruminant production system. So my work has been on beef cattle nutrition and dairy cattle nutrition. And uh, recently we started working on small ruminants as well. But again, the focus stays the same, um, how we can change the nutrition, how we can change the dietary strategies so that it reduces the methane emissions. And in this talk, uh, I would also like to share how this part of the puzzle of feed additives and nutrition fits into the larger picture of carbon footprint um, and also the circular economy uh, that uh, we are focusing on uh, in the animal agriculture. So uh, before uh, I start, I would just like to give you a very brief introduction on the importance of the circular economy and why we discuss uh, this when we talk about sustainability. Because, I mean, the linear economy as compared to circular economy, um, when we talk about the linear economy, um, it is the raw product that is being used for manufacturing of the products. And now these products have been disposed. So in this entire economic cycle, we are assuming that the raw material that with which the economy has started is in unlimited supply. And also we are not thinking of disposing the waste products that is left over after the product consumption. Okay, so if you look at this graph here, so we start with the raw materials and then we just dispose of the product. And we can now very well imagine that this kind of economy has a lot of environmental challenges and a lot of challenges in the sustainability aspect. Because first of all, we are assuming an unlimited supply of raw material. And secondly, we do not have plan for disposing of the waste products. So this is not a sustainable economy. 
So, but when we talk about the circular economy, we are thinking in terms of a circle, we are thinking in terms of a cycle, where we are actually thinking of how we can reduce, reuse, and recycle different components of the economy. So when I say reduce, we are trying to reduce the, 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 the raw materials that are being used in the economy as much as possible by recycling and by reusing some of the product waste. So even just if you go by this concept, that tells us that circular economy supports the concept of sustainability because we are working on like putting less impact on the raw materials we are using less uh, raw materials, and then we also are trying to recycle the waste products that are being generated in this system. OK, so that's why the concept of circular economy is important. Now, when we discuss about the effects, like how the circular economy applies to animal agriculture, if I just give you a very, very simple example, very broad example here, um, this is an example of a circular economy where Animals, uh, they are providing meat and milk. In return, they are providing manure. This manure is going to soil and the crops. They are functioning as fertilizers. And then these uh, fertilizers from manure can be used for growing animal feeds. And then these feeds are being consumed by animals. So this is a cycle and this is a circular economy. Why we call it a circular economy? Because the waste product that is being generated from the animal agriculture is now being used in the soil as a fertilizer for growing more animal feed. And this animal feed is a raw material that can be used by animals. Now we are actually reducing the import of raw materials from outside in the system because we are growing that in-house using, a, using uh, the fertilizer from the manure, okay? But still, even if you think about this circular economy, there are some components that are coming from outside, for example, animal feeds, because whatever we can grow in house may not be enough for animals. So we always have to import some feed. Maybe these are some grains, some minerals, some vitamin mixes, and then we have to have some fertilizer inputs as well, because yes, manure is a very good source of fertilizer, but sometimes it is not very well balanced for N, P and K, and we need to have some of these fertilizer inputs. So these are the inputs that are coming to this animal agriculture system. And then the output that is going out of the system that is not being used in the system on farm scale are meat and milk. So these are the outputs and these are the inputs. However, the, the crux of this entire uh, circular economy for animal agriculture stays on using less and less raw materials less bringing of the uh, imported feeds and using the waste product of this manure. Now, sometimes when we speak uh, with our produ dairy producers, especially, they don't uh, tell us that, you know, they are working in, a, in producing milk. They say that they are in the manure management business and the byproduct is milk because that's the bigger challenge for them, how to recycle this manure, how to use this manure. And that shows us that they are thinking in terms of circular economy. So when we talk about this, the circular economy, it is not very simple concept, right? Because there are so many parts that are moving in this entire system. Yes, we did talk about the animal feed, fertilizer inputs, we did talk about the meat and the milk, but there are some leakages in this system. And the leakages are, for example, nitrogen. Uh, in the form of ammonia volatilization, in the form of um, uh, nitrous oxide emissions. Some greenhouse gases like uh, methane, uh, nitrous oxide, they are lost in the air. Um, methane is being produced by enteric fermentation, so that's a leak of, of carbon from the system. Nitrous oxide, that is a leakage of nitrogen from the system. Okay. Now, when we are applying manure uh, to soil uh, and crops, again, nitrogen and phosphorus are being lost uh, to the surface and to the groundwater. And I'm pretty sure Dr. Jose Dubé will give more insights on, on that part. Uh, but these are the leakages that we are seeing uh, in this concept of the circular economy. And it does make sense, right, to, to reduce as much as leakage as possible. And that's why our focus has been on reducing the enteric methane emissions from the, from the livestock 
and also to manage manure in such a way that it reduces the nitrous oxide emissions so that the leakage of nitrogen, the leakage of carbon from the system towards outside is as low as possible. Now, when we think in terms of the carbon cycle, uh, we all say that this is a more sustainable carbon cycle because this animal agriculture, and especially when we talk about the cow-calf operations, the cat beef cattle grazing operations, it is a more circular system because these animals are actually consuming the carbon from the grasses that is fixed by the process of photosynthesis. Now, this carbon is being emitted uh, as methane. This methane goes in the environment, and then depending on how many years, like in by the half-life of methane is 12 years, this methane is then converted to carbon dioxide. This carbon dioxide goes to the environment, and by the process of photosynthesis, it is being, uh, it is being fixed in pasture, in grasses as well. And at the same time, in the grazing operations, we are sequestering carbon. So we can see that in this entire process of carbon cycle, methane is a part, but the carbon that is coming out from methane is actually the carbon that is being fixed by the process of photosynthesis. It is not the carbon that is coming out from the fossil fuel. Okay. However, this is still uh, some losses do happen here in terms of carbon, and it does make sense that we try to minimize this loss of methane as much as possible when we are thinking about the carbon footprint of animal agriculture. Now, this is the data that came out very recently last year in the scientific reports, and they looked at the global food system emissions, that is the greenhouse gas emissions coming from the food systems, that is the systems that is used for growing food for human consumption. And you can see that we can definitely argue about the numbers, how they estimated these numbers, but you can see that beef and milk definitely has a major chunk in this pie chart as far as the greenhouse gas emissions are concerned. And this is the data from 2020. And similar uh, trends we have seen in, in other papers as well, uh, especially when the data we are talking between 2018 to 2021, we get similar impact where if you just talk about the food systems, uh, the chunk of the greenhouse gas emissions that is coming from the livestock is on the greater level as compared to other parts. Now, let, if we go to the Paris Agreement goals, uh, we all know that uh, in this Paris Agreement, uh, there is a consensus that we should limit the increase of the temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Okay, And then there are so many ways in which uh, this agreement has suggested that what should be done so that the temperature does not exceed beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius. There is one very important point in this Paris Agreement that there has to be a global balance between anthropogenic emissions by sources and removal by sinks of greenhouse gases. So in other words, I can say that they are talking about the balance of the carbon, okay? Or they're also talking about the uh, carbon footprint or carbon neutrality, okay? So whatever emissions that are produced from this livestock some of these carbon should be sequestered or should be removed. Um, uh, and that's how we can maintain that carbon neutrality. And maybe that's the best way going forward if you would like to have just the temperature restricted to 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, by 2100. Okay. Now, when we talk about the sinks, when we talk about the sources, this is an example of a carbon dioxide and the methane cycle. This is uh, overlapping uh, uh, information from the, the, the image that I previous, previously shared. But we can see that the sources of carbon emissions are animals and manures because they are producing methane. Um, so that these are the sources. Um, fossil fuel combustion, when they are using some of these tractors um, and this fossil fuel is producing carbon dioxide, so that's another source of carbon. And the sinks of the carbon are the soil carbon. The sinks of the carbon are when they are fixing this carbon dioxide by the process of photosynthesis. So when we talk about the animal agriculture, there are sources and there are sinks. Why are these important? Because we can use these sources and sinks and we can manage them properly so that we achieve that carbon neutrality. 
So whatever carbon is being generated by this system, this entire agri the livestock system are able to sequester or use that carbon as well. So the overall balance of this entire system becomes zero. Okay, so we need to have a proper uh, information about the sinks and the sources of great greenhouse gas emissions so that we can use some of the management strategies that we can use uh, to reach uh, zero carbon or carbon neutrality. So whenever we think about the carbon neutrality, these are the three uh, most important uh, solutions that we should be able to do. Uh, the first one is avoid emissions. Now, when we say avoid emissions, so we are trying to get away from using the fossil fuels and we are moving towards renewable sources of energy. OK, so we are not relying on the carbon that is stored in the ground. We are not bringing it out in the atmosphere. We are just using some of the renewable sources of energy. Okay, so in this way, we are avoiding this emissions of carbon dioxide using fossil fuels. We decrease the losses of, of the emissions. Okay, uh, and then we'll, we'll discuss about this decrease emissions in the second part. And then we focus more on the circular economy where we are using the waste products of the system. This way we can avoid emissions. Okay, now the second point that has been suggested is decrease emissions. And this is what I will be focusing on the next couple of slides, is that how we can decrease emissions by reducing enteric fermentations or by using some dietary strategies, by management strategies, or we can also reduce the emissions from the soil and the manure management. We can also decrease emissions by the land use and the land use changes. So avoid emissions, decrease emissions, and we can increase sinks so that the carbon is sequestered and we can remove that carbon from the atmosphere. And the major practice that can be used is land use and land use changes. OK, now the first couple of points as far as decrease emissions are concerned and where my work has been focused on is how we can use some livestock management practices and some feeding management practices so that we can reduce these emissions. And we should now think about uh, this part in an entire system of the circular economy and a zero carbon or carbon neutrality. So when we think about the management practices, the way we can decrease emissions is by improving the reproductive performance, by genetic selections of those animals that are more efficient at converting feed to product and they are not producing more waste, increasing weaning weight. So that means we are feeding calves in such a way or uh, we are raising calves in such a way, they are using the same amount of resources, but then they are increasing the weaning weight. And also, secondly, we are decreasing the calf loss because if there's a calf morbidity or calf mortality, these calves have used the resources, but now these resources are not part of the system. So we are losing those resources. So if we lose, if we decrease this calf mortality, we can decrease the overall emissions from the system. The second point uh, is the feeding management, uh, how we can change the way we feed our animals. So the grazing management is first option, like the rotational grazing, the type of grasses that we are growing, the mixes of the grasses in the legume. So these are some of the feeding management strategies that can reduce the inputs of fertilizers. Uh, because if you're using legumes, that reduces the input of fertilizers that are coming in the system. If you're using good quality forages for grazing, then it improves the efficiency of the feed utilization and the methane emissions will go down or the greenhouse gas emissions will go down from this entire system. If you are using the feed additives, for example, these chemical inhibitors like 3-nitroxypropanol, which is very effective in reducing um, um, uh, emissions from the high forage fed animals in the range of 40%, as we discussed earlier. In the case of high grain diets, we have seen that it can reduce by 90%. That is so effective. So this is a very effective strategy to reduce uh, methane emissions. Uh, red algae, there have been some studies that came out from University of California, Davis. They have shown that, yes, some of these algae can reduce the emissions by 70 to 80 percent. That is the maximum levels. And then we can also use legumes uh, as a part of the dietary strategy to reduce uh, the methane emissions. So that's a feeding management. And I'll just share a couple of slides on how feeding management has worked. So this is an example of uh, two different management practices. The one, the light blue, and the one is dark blue. The one light blue 
is a conventional management practices where we have not introduced anything that is more controlled towards reducing management. And then the dark bar here is when we are introducing this mitigation scenario, uh, mitigation management practices. What are mitigation management practices? So controlled mating, early weaning, winter supplementation, pasture improvement with legumes, all of these strategies were used in this system on the cow calf, the complete cycle one and two, and then the fattening animals. And you can see that regardless of which production system we are talking about, the emission intensity that we have on the y-axis is lower if we have these management practices being used in the system. Okay, so these are effective and we can reduce the intensity of emissions as long as we make sure that some of these management management practices are well thought of and very well executed and implemented in these systems. There are a lot of different ways of reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, like the dietary strategies on a short-term basis, management strategies on the short-term basis, but as far as animal breeding, that's a long-term mitigation strategies. Rumen manipulation, that's a long-term mitigation strategy because now we are changing the microbial profile that will be consistent for a very long duration and animals will be able to reduce methane for the longer duration. And the reason why we share dietary strategies and management strategies are short-term because if you change those management strategies, the emission intensities of the total emissions will go back to the baseline level very fast. Okay. So these are some of the dietary strategies. So for example, if we increase forage quality like harvest and the store management, we can decrease methane per unit of milk produced by 5%. And some of these strategies are very easy for our producers to implement. Okay? So in this case, when we say increased forage quality, what we mean is that the NDF digestibility has been increased by 5%. Forage type, if we start using some improved cultivars that have a greater digestibility, for example, brown midrib varieties. Now, these are the varieties that have lower lignin and greater fiber digestibility. We can see that methane intensity can be reduced from 0%. Some studies have not seen any effect to 4%. Processing grains, and again, the reason why we process grains so that the more energy is available easily for, for the ruminants, we can decrease the intensity by 1 to 2.5%. Increase dry matter intake by changing the particle size of the forages, by increasing the forage digestibility, we can decrease intensity by 2 to 6%. So these dietary strategies are very easy to implement at the farm. The good thing about these strategies is that it not only reduce the intensity, but also improve the production level of animals. However, you can see that the level of reduction is pretty decent. I mean, around 5%. It's not what we have seen when we are using feed additives. So let me give an example of the feed additive. So this is a this is the study that we did with nitroxypropanol in beef cattle fed high forage diets. So on the x-axis, you can see that from 0 to 24, these are 24 hours okay, of the day. And then 0 hour is the time when nitroxypropanol is added to the diets. And the y-axis here is the total methane emissions in grams per day. Okay. Now the black line here, you can see that black line, when no nitroxypropanol is added, initially methane emissions goes up. And by the end of the day, it goes down. However, when methane is added at zero hours, you can see that both low and high concentrations, the methane production is very low for first 12 to 14 hours, and then later on, it is very comparable to, um, to the control animal. So nitroxypropanol, when added to the diet, it is very effective for first 12 hours, but then when it is metabolized, it is no longer effective. And that's why we have to feed this additive every day. If you don't feed every day, we won't have the sustained reduction of methane production. The good thing about this study was that we reduced methane and we are conserving energy because methane is a loss of gross energy. And this energy was used for improving feed efficiency. So this is an example of how the feed efficiency was improved. On the x-axis, we have these three different treatments controlled, low levels of NOP and high levels of NOP. 
and the y axis we have gain to feed ratio and the higher the gain to feed ratio the more efficient these animals are and you can see that we are reducing methane emissions for low and high and the intensity or oh, sorry the feed efficiency goes up from 1.4 0.14 to 0.15 into 0.154. So that's a good thing. Not only we are reducing the intensity of emissions or the total emissions, we are diverting that energy towards feed efficiency. Okay, and the gain to feed ratio has been improved. And this is exactly what we would like to see. Yes, our goal is to reduce the intensity, reduce the total methane emissions, but for our producers, it has to be sustainable. And they have to see the impact on the production efficiency. And that's exactly what we saw in this study. And the lastly, the third point is increasing sinks, like improved soil fertility and crop or pasture productivity, incorporating legumes into pastures or crop rotations, incorporate deep rooted perennials into pastures, plant trees, reforestation, afforestation, agroforestry, and restoring overgrazed and eroded paddocks. And I'm pretty sure Dr. Uh, Dubey will have more to share on increasing things um, and, and based on some of these managemental practices. So this is it from my side. And again, thank you very much for your attention. And I'll be very happy to take any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Divakar. That was an extraordinary presentation. Um, so I took some notes. In fact, thank you so much for the introduction of the circular economy of your uh, animal agriculture perspective and how can we change the nutrition to decrease the emission and also with the, these mitigation scenarios that uh, enlightened us into the, the overview that we needed uh, to get uh, some more information uh, regarding um, uh, sustained reduction on methane emissions. So uh, I would just check the. I will just check the slide, Slido, uh, to see if we have any questions from the audience. In the meantime, um, I have a question. Oh, okay, I will. I will take the opportunity to ask my question that matches the question from Slido, which is if you have any evidence on the use of this additive. Uh, I think three nitroxypropanol um, on the long term. Uh, what is the, the effect regarding the sustained reduction of methane? Um, yeah, yeah, definitely yes. Um, so the studies that uh, we conducted earlier, uh, which was one of the very initial studies, we did this for about four months. Four okay, months four on months. the animals that were fed high forage diets, and then we gave a break of four weeks, mm -hmm. and then we used same animals on the high grain diets, and we saw sustained reduction for the entire four months without any signs of uh, adaptation that you know, the methane production is going up. But as soon as you remove that nitroxypropanol from the diet, you can see that the methane emissions start going back up. So okay, okay. It, it, yeah, it reduces as long as we have this in the diet. And uh, once you take it out, it goes back to the normal that shows that it does get metabolized very fast. And um, you need to give, and I think I used for about four months, and there have been some mm -hmm. studies where they are using for even longer duration, and they have not seen any signs of adaptation, and methane stays down. Yeah, this is why you need to keep adding this as an additive to the animal feed, right? That's right. That's right. Yes. yes. Professor Diwakar, another question just uh, popped in. Uh, and someone is asking, uh, do you study um, the influence of this additive on the nutrient density of animals? Um, mm -hmm. Maybe not only the nutrient density, but also on the nutritional quality, if it does affect. Yeah. So, um the amount, the level of this NOP that is added in the diet is so low. I mean, this is on PPM mm -hmm. levels. Uh, it's a milligram per kilogram uh, levels of the diet. So we are ranging from 20 milligrams per kilogram to 60 milligrams per kilogram. So it does not influence the nutrient density of the diet because it is added at a very small levels. And actually, just to compare, uh, the levels of this additive is very similar to the levels of our micro minerals that is added to the diets of beef and the dairy cattle. Again, very, very small level. So it does not influence the nutrient density. 
However, I mean, if I use the same concept here and I uh, share, the, I mean, I discuss about other additives like nitrates. Mm -hmm. Now, nitrates are added in, in percentages. So maybe like, you know, 0.5% or 1%, mm -hmm. they might influence the density. They might influence some of the parameters. Okay. Um, but in the case of NOP, no, they will not. Yes, yes. That's that's uh, that's an interesting comparison. Um, also, there's an, maybe an important question in here for you to ask. Um, those additives that you uh, have been uh, telling us, at least the three nitroxypropanolol and also other nitrates, are those additives certified for organic farming? Uh, that's a good this question. This is a tricky one. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know about that. Um, I don't know. Um, I know that uh, um, they are going through certification process, not not mm -hmm. for organic farming, but to be included as a feed additive um, yeah, okay. for the conventional livestock operations. And at some countries, it has been approved. In the U.S., it is still going through the certification process. It has not been approved yet. So if you if you feed in our experiments, we have to throw milk. Um, in Canada, when we were adding this additive uh, for our feedlot animals, we had to give them at least a month of uh, clearance uh, before we uh, market these animals, before we slaughter these animals. So right now, um, in the US, it is not approved, but in some countries it is. But for organic farming, I'm not sure. Yeah, we probably need more studies to, to make sure that uh, sure. Yes. Uh, there are no metabolites uh, accumulating yes. into the beef meat, right? Yes. Um, so conscious of time, I'll just ask the last part of the last question that I have here, which is, do you think that this um, nitroxypropanol affects uh, gut microbiome? Because in the rumen, uh, it is metabolized. It is metabolized in the rumen or in the, uh, in the intestines. So it is metabolized in the rumen. And um, there are some studies that have shown that, yes, it does influence gut microbiome, although indirectly. There's, uh, okay. I don't think there's a direct effect on the gut microbiome because nitroxypropanol inhibits the last step of methane synthesis because mm -hmm. it is a structural analog of methyl coenzyme M. So it, it reduces the methane production and maybe because of increased hydrogen, because now hydrogen is not going towards methane, right? Hydrogen is being accumulated in the rumen. Now, increased partial pressure of hydrogen may have effects on the rumen microbiome, and that's why we see changes. Okay, yeah but it may not be the direct effect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Diwakar. This was a very interesting view on the efficacy of these um, additives in reducing the enteric methane emissions. Uh, so it's it was a, a very nice vision of uh, what we might, might expect in the following years. Thank you so much, Professor Diwakar. I will now give the floor to Professor José Dubo. Uh, thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoy this session. Hey, Daniela, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear it. See the full screen? Yes, I'm already watching in full screen. Perfect. Okay, um, first of all, it's it's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to uh, to thank the organizer, the, the Food for Sustainability, and uh, thanks, Daniela, for the session. We, um, we're going to talk today about uh, sustainable intensification of uh, beef cattle production. And uh, first of all, um, what is a sustainable livestock system? And uh, we think that we, when you talk about sustainability, we need to focus on those three dimensions, the social, the economic, and also the environmental dimension. And you're uh, looking for this uh, sweet spot here in the middle where we can have an overlap, overlap of those uh, different dimensions. And it's always a challenge to uh, be locally relevant for local producers uh, in our region, but at the same time address the global issues. Uh, but that's what uh, a continuous exercise uh, on our side, you know, try to at the same time that you're helping the local uh, production systems, be also uh, looking at uh, the bigger global issues. Uh, and in the social dimension, uh, we need to understand the, the producer's mind. Uh, there are different um, things, you know, uh, 
on, on the social aspect, like land tenure and farm size, or the economics that goes with that in terms of scale of operation. Um, some of the produce they have off farm activities. Some others they they just have a piece of land as a way of life, and they have another job. And and uh, so each one is a is a different uh, story. Uh, we did a tour in several uh, production systems, different farms, uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, it was interesting to see that uh, sometimes they have a common problem, but they always had like a different solution for for those problems, and and they were all right because their conditions were different, and th there was not a common thing, you know, that <laughs> they 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 would use. So they, that was a very good exercise uh, learning learning those. But uh, I, I'm going to focus mostly on the environmental di dimension today. Uh, so overarching goals is, is really try to reduce the carbon footprint of livestock systems. Uh, and one of the big pieces that you're doing is try to reduce nitrogen input from fertilizer because nitrogen is manufactured using fossil fuels and has a, a large carbon footprint. We're also trying to increase the ecosystem diversity because I think we can use more uh, efficiently the natural resources uh, in, in, and at the end, you know, you know the, the whole goal is to produce more with less inputs. And also it's not only about beef or milk, um, grazing systems also um, they deliver uh, several ecosystem services that are, are very important. So we're trying also to maximize uh, those ecosystem services. Um, so, uh, one of the, the main goals of our program here is try to reduce off farm inputs. Things like um, nitrogen fertilizer, machinery, fossil fuel. Um, so all of those things uh, are inputs like uh, uh, Dr. Views mentioned. So we are trying to, to minimize those off farm inputs, but at the same time, uh, continue you know, being sustainable. And, and maximize also the ecosystem service of the production systems. Um, and another important thing that I'm going to mention today is that uh, it really depends on where you put the boundary of your system. Um, uh, at, so we, we're trying to uh, mitigate carbon emissions at, at the farm level, and you know not not use the cow as a boundary, but at the farm as a boundary. And and at at, at a given farm. I think you can um, mitigate, you know, some of those um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions that that comes from the system. If you have a system approach and uh, and put your boundary a little, you know, beyond the cow. So measure uh, of farm inputs that you are trying to reduce are, are those um, nitrogen fertilizer, fossil fuels, machinery. Those all are important, and as we reduce those, we also reduce the carbon footprint of the systems. Um, we have, um, not sure if I can say a long term trial, but it's been eight years already that you're, you know, assessing those different systems. But basically, if you can, you know, see the orange one, it's just grass plus nitrogen fertilizer, and you're putting per year 224 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. You know, of course, it's split in several applications in the cool season, warm season, but at the end, it's 224. And if you go to the bottom just um, for sake of the time, is the other extreme, which is the grass plus legume mixtures, where you have clovers and, and uh, summer legume, Arax labrata, this one with the yellow flower. Uh, in this system, we are using only 34 kilograms of nitrogen per year. Uh, so we're reducing from 224 to 34. So that's like a redu reduction of 85% of nitrogen fertilizing input. Um, the one in the middle is just, you know, unfertilized by here grass, but without the summer legume and in the cool season, similar to the gray one. Uh, some of the numbers that you've been collecting here, these are, these are very solid numbers, you know, um, several years of data. But uh, at the end, we are, you know, producing similar gains in the grass legume system compared to the nitrogen fertilized system, as you can see here. Uh, so we are able to reduce 85% of the nitrogen fertilizer input. And with that, we are also reducing the carbon footprint of the system. And at the same time, improving other ecosystem services 
in, in that particular grass legume mixture compared to the nitrogen fertilizer system. So we think that's uh, what you know seemed to be very difficult to achieve at the beginning, which is reducing our farm inputs, cut back on those things, and at the, si the same time, keep the system sustainable. Uh, we've been able to achieve that by you know integrating mainly uh, forage legumes in warm season in the cool season. We've been assessing a lot of the uh, nitrogen cycling in those systems. I apologize the, the, for the English units here, but I didn't have time to redo everything back. We, we do a lot of extension with uh, those English units, but pretty much we're trying to, uh, you know, if you compare those uh, two systems here, uh, which are, are those that we just mentioned, there's a larger input of fertilizer here in the first system uh, with nitrogen fertilized grass, while here we have the uh, nitrogen input from biological nitrogen fixation. We're also measuring some of the uh, leakage, uh, like Professor V has mentioned, uh, ammonia volatilization, nitrous oxide emissions, recycle uh, back, you know, uh, through feces and urine, how much coming back through, you know, the litter. Uh, so at the end of the story, I want you to focus uh, here at this bottom table, we have the performance uh, data, but at the last row, we have the gain per pound of nitrogen input uh, in the nit nitrogen fertilized uh, grass system and the gain per pound of nitrogen input in the grass legume mixture. What I'm trying to say is that the nitrogen cycling is much more efficient in the grass legume system because the losses are much less compared to the nitrogen fertilized uh, system. So here, pretty much for each unit of nitrogen that is cycled into the system, you're producing two to three times more beef. So that's really uh, an important aspect of, of those systems. We did measure some metallic methane emission from those systems, and there was a trend here to uh, decrease the methane emission intensity, which is the methane per kilogram of average daily gain. Uh, this BHR is the gray you know, system. I'm sorry, let me go back. Uh, where you, we had you know, much less uh, methane emission per each unit of gain. And we also compare the cool and the warm season. We have less methane emission per kilogram of average daily gain in the cool season compared to the warm season. And that's mainly because the cool season forage here in subtropical regions, they are much better in terms of quality. And, and at the end, the animals gain more. The methane emission didn't vary much, but because the gains were greater, uh, at the end, the ratio is slower here in this system. Uh, another component, which is the ecosystem services, uh, we saw many more bees in the grass legume system here, as you see here. We sampled that for three years, and we we found you know a greater presence of bees in the grass legume mixtures. One of my students, uh, he's he's doing a, a life cycle assessment of those different systems, uh, and that's the. Uh, the global warming potential of those systems, and, and as expected here, the uh, the grass legume, or not, I'm sorry, the, the fertilized system has a bigger carbon footprint uh, compared to, to the legume system. This is still preliminary, but it, we can see here the enteric fermentation is really a big piece of this, uh, uh, you know, the, the carbon footprint. So, but there are many others like nitrogen fertilizer, we're reducing a lot of here, in the in the legumes and that is helping to reduce the carbon footprint here. So another thing we are trying to graze as much as possible because by grazing the animal would select the forages, they will recycle back the nutrients, uh, and you reduce the amount of fertilizer needed compared to hay systems, for example, where you need to harvest everything, remove, and then you need to put it back. In this case, the cows are doing the job. Um, so we've you know, by using a subtropical grass, the matria, we've been able to uh, stockpile, which is pretty much just accumulate that grass over a period of time to use at a later date. And you may need to use some supplementation depending on the target uh, performance. But uh, with that system, we've been proving that we can graze all year round here in this region of, uh, of uh, Florida that was not, you know, possible before. And there are many places in the world that you could do something similar. And I understand, you know, that probably would be more appropriate for beef systems or maybe develop some heifers in dairy systems. But uh, uh, in this case, in the cool season forages, we have several options here uh, in the warm season as well. And, and that 
the stockpiling management could fill up the gap here in the fall. So I know we've been talking a lot about that, and that's one of the goals of this seminar. Uh, can sustainable livestock system be carbon neutral? And again, it, it really depends where, where you put the boundaries. I think it's possible, uh, you know, at, at the farm level. Uh, and really it depends on, um, you know, the diversification of the land cover of your farm. Uh, so there are uh, different land uses that have, uh, you know, greater potential to sequester carbon than others. So it's just a matter of, uh, you know, um, optimizing that land cover at the farm level. Um, so that's a picture of the region that we live. It's just, you know, like Google uh, Earth. So you can see uh, how diverse the landscape is. Uh, and, um, you know, at a given farm, you can, you know, I know many of them, they typically have some um, pine trees and some cropland, some grazing areas, and some, you know, different uh, land uses. Uh, so if you think about, uh, you know, the net carbon sequestration of those different land uses, uh, they are they are very different for us, and and you know, I have all the references here for those uh, rates. But for example, pine forest can go up to six tons of carbon per hectare per year, considering the below ground and also uh, the above ground carbon that is going for like for, um, for the timber industry or construction, for example. Uh, natural forest that's the sequestration rate. Just a, a grass, but here grass low input pasture it doesn't sequester much, so that would probably not be enough to mitigate the, uh, the emissions from the system. But as you have a, a mosaic of uh, land uses at the farm level, you can mix uh, those different uh, sequestration rates and, and do the budget at, at the farm level. So we put together some uh, different scenarios here. For example, if you only have bahia grass uh, in the system, it's probably going to be a, a source of carbon, it's, you know, just Grass, the whole 100% of the farm is Bahia grass low input, is not going to sequester enough carbon um, to reduce uh, emissions. But if you put 30% of pine trees in that farm and use 70% of improved grass, which sequester more carbon, then in that case, that farm is a carbon sink. And then it's actually helping to sequester carbon. And really, you know, even maintaining some of the native vegetation like the rangelands that they do sequester carbon, and there are some data showing that uh, at a good level. You know, you know, mixing with improved grass or 10% wetland, anyhow, we can do several combinations of those different land uses. And, uh, and, you know, at the end, at the farm level, you can get some uh, um, numbers in terms of carbon sink for the whole system. So it really depends. I mean, the animal is not the boundary. I think the boundary should be the farm level. Uh, so that we can um, think about planning better the, the land use. And, and how can we measure that? Uh, I'm collaborating with some people smarter than me, uh, you know, these AI machine learning folks that they're trying to put together different things. <laughs> and you're working on remote sensing of landscapes and try to go there on the ground truth. And that's how I'm helping with putting my boots on the ground and try to measure how much a pine tree is sequestering carbon, how much, you know, the bahia grass is sequestering carbon, and other ecosystems, it's not only carbon, you know, trying to measure, um, you know, plant diversity and different other things. But anyhow, uh, by defining those indexes uh, in, in those different um, land uses uh, and vegetation covers, uh, by remote sensing, you know, eddy flux covariances or, you know, different new technologies that are available. We could potentially define those indices for the land cover, and it would be relatively easy. Not easy, I mean, if this is smart people, <laughs> you know, we can, using remote sensing machine learning, pretty much map the land cover of a given farm. Uh, and, and as you do that, then you have an idea of, you know, how much carbon is being sequestered, how much carbon is being released, at, at the landscape level. So uh, I, I know you gave me 10 to 15 minutes, so I'm trying to stay on, on top of the time. It's, uh, I think it's possible to develop sustainable livestock system. And again, it really depends on where you put the boundary. I think at the farm level, it is possible to, to reach the carbon neutrality in beef systems. Uh, 
But again, you need to also address uh, all of those climate smart practices that Dr. V has mentioned, the, you know, folks on the dietary intervention, you know, the um, reproduction technologies, everything that you can do. But when you put all of those things together, I think it's possible. And I'll, I'll finish. I, I'm like you mentioned, I'm originally from Brazil, and those are some of the systems that I was working in Brazil before coming here to the US. And those are silver pastry systems with three legumes. Uh, and, and those are amazing systems. They are, we, they, they are all uh, carbon sink if you do the, the math in terms of the carbon emissions and sequestration and all that. So that's another example in the tropical area uh, that we, we, we can reach that. And uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity. And uh, I, I see there are a lot of uh, Portuguese folks in the call. Uh, so I wanted to say also, obrigado. Obrigado, Professor José. Thank you so much for this excellent speech. It was uh, very good to, to know a little bit more about what you do regarding this introduction of legumes into pastures, um, getting to know more about how to optimize land cover with pine trees, how to work with these grazing systems. So let's see if the audience has any questions for you. Let's check if you uh, have any questions in place at the moment. Um, so I take the opportunity to ask you, Professor José, um, just at the end of your presentation, you showed that um, farming, let's say climate farming, uh, using uh, livestock uh, in a smart way and in a sustainable way is possible, especially if we consider this boundary at the, the farm level. My question is, um, Regarding the, the results that you showed and considering uh, that having pine trees and entering the wood market could be interesting for these farmers, um, should we think about adopting like a mosaic system, uh, like uh, mandatory for the livestock management to increase carbon sequestration? Do you believe, do you think this is one of the strategies that we should be looking into at the moment? In fact, here in Florida, a lot of uh, uh, cattle ranchers, they also have uh, trees in their land. Okay. And some of them are preserving, you know, wetlands or, you know, some rangelands. So this is already a reality. I, I don't like the word mandatory. Uh, I, I think it should be optional. But uh, what we are trying to do is also try to create some label, uh, for example, a climate smart beef. So if you produce in a way that you, you know, it can be certified that you're producing in a way that, you know, at the end of uh, your production cycle, mm -hmm. you are carbon neutral. Uh, then you, you have, a, a, you know, a label on your product. And, and I think the society is willing to pay a little more to compensate for that. So that's something that uh, mm -hmm. I yes. actually worked uh, in a project with uh, Professor V is trying to, to do that. Uh, but anyhow, I think I think that's a way to do it, like have a compensation and I think uh, the society, especially, you know, the, the large cities, uh, they are willing to pay a little more to, uh, you know, for a product Red that value. is produ produced that way. Yes. Yes, yes, of course. Thank you so much for your for your answer. We have a question in place. Um, so the question is, are ruminants the good or the bad one? Putting methane production on the scale, but these are the only ones that can convert the pasture into meat, milk, etc. So, are the ruminants the good or the bad one? I think this is a tricky one. <laughs> this is a very uh, complex. It, it's not tricky. It's easy. They are the good ones, um, and uh, and I would say that uh, they upcycle, they transform fiber into um, you know uh, very good food. Right, which is very important for humans. Uh, it's been proving all over the place that is important, especially in early childhood, uh, for development. So the the ruminants are the good ones, uh, and I think it's just a matter of you know putting together the pieces and, and you know work at the, the ecosystem level and, and and try to put those things together. Of course, uh, we we need to keep in mind that it's important to mitigate those emissions uh, as much as possible. Try to diversify the system and improve the efficiency. But I, I think ruminants are key, key worldwide. You know, they are uh, actually the, 
the livelihood in different countries depends on, on ruminants. In most of the cases, they are eating um, poor, um, you know, fiber, uh, fodder, and and upcycling that in, in in good quality food for for humans. Yeah, of course. Like connecting uh, everything that you said with uh, what Professor Diwakar presented us earlier with the with the yeah. with the scheme of circular economy with livestock as part of the ecosystem producing converting giving so this is this is also a very interesting perspective so um and, uh, and in, in most of the times they are they are present in land that is 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 difficult to 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 do other things like cropping systems so um, the majority of the world Yes, yes, absolutely. So uh, as we could see, uh, the integration of legumes into uh, grass pastures uh, can potential, uh, potentially benefit uh, soil health. Um, as, you can, as we could see with carbon sequestration values presented by uh, Professor Jose. Thank you so much for your presentation. Now we will move to our next speaker. Uh, it's a pleasure to have Manuel Lainez. We on board with us. Uh, he will talk about Spanish beef cattle interprofessional code of good practices, a guide that promotes sustainable farming. Manuel Lainez, thank you so much. The floor is yours. Thank you for you. It's a pleasure to be here uh, on on behalf of Provacuno, that, as uh, you say, is the interprofessional organization of Spanish beef cattle. And uh, I would like to share with you some of the work we have been doing in the last uh, years. I try to share my screen. I don't know if, if this. We can see we it, have... but not in. Uh, or, all ah, right, perfect. it's already on Thank full you. mode. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as has been mentioned this, uh, this evening, um, the Paris Agreement was the, the start point for the Provacuno activities in the in the uh, in the goal to achieve the, the neutrality in the car in, in the uh, carbon footprint in in, in Spain. Uh, the Spanish beef sector took note of the of the reality, the, the releases of this conference and began to work and uh, establish the, the focus for the uh, next uh, 30 years. In that moment, uh, the strategy was to achieve carbon neutral uh, uh, findings at the end of this period uh, and establish a strategy to do that. Uh, the, the strategy try to, try to uh, organize the structure to work on this subject, not to achieve this subject, but to work on this subject. And what were the basis for that? Uh, first of all, the the, the main uh, aspect were uh, working with the researchers. The, 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 this was the, the main uh, change uh, in, in the behavior of this uh, interprofessional because they decided to work with Remedia, that is a, a special network in, in Spain that uh, uh, work on mitigation of climate change in the agri-food sector. Uh, after that, in the, the second aspect, important aspect, was to um, develop the good environmental practices for all the value change in the in the beef meat production chain. Uh, considering that it was important to uh, maintain the, the improvement in productivity in all the process, in the, in the farm, at, uh, or in, in, the, in the slaughterhouses, in the uh, uh, cutting uh, rooms, etc. Mm, they take into, into consideration that the carbon credits that uh, the, the European Commission has established as important could be interesting for the sector uh, in order to promote the sequestration. The, the science-based work uh, and the collaboration with researchers, that's as I, I have mentioned before, and the openness and transparency was another important base for, uh, for this strategy. And uh, in, in this framework, the main working areas were uh, to try to work in on climate change mitigation, on circular economy and uh, climate adaptation, climate change adaptation, and biodiversity the, the was this were the, the the main uh, focus areas for this strategy. Well, uh, 
what has been done uh, until now since uh, the, the most important uh, work has been done are related with the codes of good environmental practices. Uh, some uh, the 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 one the, the first was a, a, a focus the attention on the farms. The second one has focused the attention on the slaughterhouses and cutting rooms, and the third one that is is going to be released in the coming months uh, has focused the attention in the retail corners. Uh, the idea is to cover all the value chain, knowing that the most important part of the of the activities on the uh, activity to focus on the reduction of uh, CO2 emissions are the farms. But and at the same time, uh, we have been working uh, in in a, a characterization of the Spanish production sector. We have uh, used different uh, figures from from, uh, uh, from the Ministry of Agriculture and another uh, uh, data that has obtained uh, uh, through a survey uh, in 2060 farms uh, all around Spain. And after that, we have uh, released this, this document that has been the basis to uh, analyze the life cycle uh, analysis of the of, of all the value chains, uh, the, the beef cattle value chains in Spain. Uh, we have obtained an average uh, uh, CO2 emission by a kilogram of, of carcass. Um, and uh, we hope uh, this uh, study will be published in the coming months. And after that, we are going to, uh, we have been uh, started to work on circular economy, uh, composting in, in the area of composting of manure, and at the same time, try to uh, work uh, with the best available, uh, available techniques with the um, Remedia uh, group, the network of researchers. Well, I, I'm going to focus my attention on the uh, Spanish beef cattle in, uh, of the, uh, in, in the uh, good environmental practice on the farms. And uh, first of all, uh, it has been uh, uh, released with the work of different authors. The first group of authors, as you can see uh, in this slide, are all the researchers that are working in Remedia Network that uh, you, you can see there. They, are, uh, they have been participating people from different, uh, that are working in different subjects uh, in, in all the, the production uh, process. Uh, and at the same time, there has been people uh, working in the sector that has been collaborating to, to uh, adjust the, the uh, key messages for the producers. Well, the the uh, the the, uh, the goal of this code of uh, good uh, practices uh, was to uh, establish, to to uh, analyze, to revise the the list of uh, most important measures that can be applied to the farm uh, in order to mitigate uh, and the, 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 the researchers have identified these these measures and have structured and organized these, these different measures in five topics all related with animal feeding the the uh, the measure related with genetics uh, production and management the the measure related with rumen uh, function the measures related with manure uh, utilization in in in, uh, in the farm and the, in the application of the manure and all related with the use of different pastures and, and crops well uh, for uh, every one of these available measures uh, the the authors uh, uh, give uh, uh, gave a, a advice for the producers trying to identify what was the impact uh, the impact in three uh, uh, possibilities the the emission when, when the emission reduction can be of this measure can be superior to 25 percent of the uh, current emissions uh, uh, the measure can reduce the 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 uh, emissions between 10 and, and 25 percent and the the measure that can reduce uh, the uh, the emissions of uh, greenhouse gases uh, greenhouse gases uh, below 10 percent the next uh, group of advice was related with the economy the economy uh, trying to uh, to give an idea to the farmer that uh, the the uh, the investment to in, in, uh, introduce this uh, measure could 
benefit the production process or cost the uh, something some, some, uh, something to the uh, producer another aspect is related with the side effects because as uh, it has been already mentioned uh, this evening there are some uh, measures that can uh, impact the the methane emission and at the same time the, the uh, ammonia emission and this uh, is explained in in every measure the, the combination uh, of this or, or the combination between the the uh, emissions uh, methane emissions with another biodiversity and another kind of of uh, environmental issues uh, in the surroundings of the of the farm and at the same time uh, at that time it was studied the the availability uh, technological availability of every one of these measures uh, explaining that it, it, some of them were at the laboratory uh, scale and another one was uh, available at this moment in, in 2021. And uh, this is the summary of the of the measures related with every one of these uh, big uh, topics in in the farm. Well, uh, to give you some big idea about what is uh, been analyzed and what is been uh, given to the producers, uh, if we focus our attention on animal uh, feeding, the, for every one of these measures, it has been explained to the producers that what uh, could be the impact, uh, what could be the the. Uh, the economical uh, aspect, what is the availability of every one of these measures, and uh, what will be the combination, the cross-cutting uh, issues related with sustainability. And for example, uh, to, uh, the, the, the use of local protein sources is very important. Uh, it, uh, it, it is directly uh, uh, or direct, uh, directly affects the methane emissions and the methane, no, the, the uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, is, it, it is caused because, uh, for example, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the code is explained how to uh, reduce the importations of uh, soya bean in Spain could be, uh, uh, need to uh, use another kind of protein supplements that are uh, expensive are more expensive for the producers and is available at the moment of the publication of the of the uh, uh, code. Mm, the same, for example, for the use of agricultural uh, agroalimentary byproducts uh, in the diets, precision farmings, uh, uh, far feedings. That is, the, these are measures that could be uh, uh, introduced in in, in a, a proper way. Another group uh, that has been uh, uh, commented this evening is all related with the, uh, the, the control or the function of their grooming. And uh, one of the, uh, the possibilities is to use feed additives. And uh, another possibility is to, uh, to use additives that improve the rumen performance and, at the, uh, and, and try to introduce early uh, development of the ruminal activities, in, especially in, in, not in, in uh, beef cattle, but mostly in, in dairy cattle. But it's possible uh, to introduce in, in uh, beef cattle too. Well, this is the, in every one of these measures is, is explained it what, uh, what are the impacts on the greenhouse uh, uh, gases uh, contribution and the other aspects? The, uh, the genetic reproduction and management of the farms, some practices have impact uh, on, the, on the emissions uh, too. And for example, uh, to increase or to improve the uh, animal uh, health performance in the in the farm is important because it it, it cost uh, uh, it it does, it doesn't cost uh, money for the producers. Uh, on the contrary, they uh, the, they reduce the the expenditures and at the same time reduce the impact the global impact per uh, kilo of uh, of carcass per carcass kilo of of beef production and it's very easy to apply. Uh, but there are another aspects related, especially with uh, genetic selection, selection that is uh, important, can uh, be an important uh, uh, tool 
to increase the efficiency and at the same time re reduce the, the emissions, but it takes time and it's, it, it is uh, at, at this moment uh, was at the uh, uh, lab uh, development. It was introduced in some uh, uh, genetic selection uh, schemes in, in, in Spain, but not in beef production, but in, in uh, dairy production. Well, another uh, aspects are related with the, the, the longevity in females or the, the housing conditions of the animal welfare or are related direct or indirectly with the emissions. Another aspect important is all related with the manner, manner, uh, management in the farm. And for example, other uh, measures like Cora slurry stores. Uh, slurry is, is, is common in Spain, in the north of Spain, uh, in beef production, not in the in the middle, in the center of in the south of the country, because uh, the, 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 the rainfall is not important and uh, Usually, the, it not produces uh, the, the farms uh, produce manure and not the slurry. But in the north, is possible, and we have some uh, examples of, of farms that work like in this way. But uh, the, the slurry stores improve. Uh, the uh, another uh, measure that is important in the case of slurry is uh, to separate the the solid and the liquid fractions. The uh, to use uh, impermeable. Uh, uh, money storage. Uh, well, another uh, aspect is to use biogas digesters uh, in inhibition of uh, the, the uh, liberation of nitrogen, uh, uh, establish some uh, uh, the cover the, the, the uh, manure storage is another possibility. There are some uh, tools that can be uh, Applied and that has and that, that at this moment are being considered by the Ministry of Agriculture as uh, uh, best available te uh, technologies in order to, uh, to to impose them to the producers. And another group of uh, of measures are related with the the use of the of the the the. Uh, the pastures on the crop on the crops and uh, some of the measures that has been mentioned before in the previous presentations related with the use of legumes the the fertilization of the uh, of the plots the 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 use or the application of the uh, slurry or the application of the manure uh, all are related with the the emission and at the same time the possibility to use the the uh, the, the area the, the areas that are uh, used for forage or for forage production or, or for uh, the consume of animals uh, can be used as a sequestration uh, area uh, in order to reduce the, the balance and at the end uh, achieve a, a less impactful uh, production system in, 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 in general. And all of that are uh, consider in in those uh, in in these groups of, of measures for the uh, producers well of all of this uh, uh, code has been uh, explained it has been transferred to uh, uh, technicians all around Spain it has been used by, by the Ministry of Agriculture in a special uh, um, transfer process for technicians in order to advise them and uh, trying to uh, to promote the use of this code uh, in in the in the at the farm level uh, or around Spain and this is all I wanted to share with you thank you for the uh, for for uh, the possibility to to share all this information and all the activities that Provacuno has been doing in the last years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manuel. Such an amazing work that you showed us today. This overview of this code of good practices to be applied at the farm level. It's uh, it's quite interesting to, to have an overview of these uh, five types of management strategies that you selected through feed, rumen, genetics, 
manure and pasture and crops. I think I didn't miss any, any of that. Um, now I will just see if we have any questions for you. But in the meantime, um, I take the opportunity to ask you, Manuel, so uh, from your experience, this guide, this uh, code of good practices has been used as a way to convert the farming systems to more sustainable ones or it has been used to uh, label or classify the animal production as a decision tool to, to advance in livestock production? Well, the first uh, objective of this guide is to, uh, to um, convince the producers that uh, all related with the greenhouse uh, gas emissions is an important aspect for uh, uh, beef cattle production. This is the first to sensibilize mm -hmm. the, the producers. Uh, after that, there are some uh, professionals that have started to that have started to work with it uh, because the the retail uh, uh, companies uh, in mm -hmm. Spain have started to uh, ask questions about that and about the, the, the practices the producers have uh, been applying on their um, farms. And that's uh, the, the reason we consider that is uh, it is being used more than it was uh, previously uh, uh, thought that it could be used. Nowadays, uh, there are some group of producers that are using this code in order to do that. We are not going to uh, uh, differentiate between different uh, production systems in Spain. In Spain, we have a particular uh, production system because uh, mm -hmm. uh, I suppose uh, our system, our production system has similarities with Portuguese uh, production system because we have um, the females are uh, on the pasture, uh, but uh, at the same time, in some uh, parts of the country, it's, differ it's difficult to uh, to grow animals uh, uh, from uh, until the the uh, the weight and that they uh, need to go to the slaughterhouse. And uh, because we haven't enough uh, for us, enough, enough pasture to feed uh, these animals uh, on the on the pasture, and because of that, we need the uh, the, the intensification and the feeding systems uh, in the in the last period of the of, of the growing period of, uh, in in the in, in mm -hmm. our production system. And, we are not going to classify the the farms. We need to um, use this tool in order to improve the the uh, efficiency, uh, the efficiency on the use of of carbon. That is the same that reduce the emissions. Yes, absolutely. So as a take home message to raise awareness and help improve the, the sustainability of, of the system. Manuel, I have a, an interesting question. Uh, popping in and the question is so the new uh, PAC um, the new common agricultural policy requires that part of the farm must be dedicated to biodiversity conservation this measure can bring added value in economic terms for farmers well I, I'm going to answer uh, taking into consideration the the application of, of the uh, uh, Common agricultural policy in Spain. In Spain, the the use of this uh, or, or the farmers has the possibility to receive an a, a extra amount of of money if they uh, use different practices or they apply different practices. And one of them that is applied to the uh, animals that are the, the uh, to the females that are on the pasture is to uh, dedicate this uh, uh, part of these hectares of the farm uh, to this subject to the biodiversity con conservation and but it, this is not possible to use mm -hmm. by the uh, producers that uh, work on intensive farms, uh, growing intensive farms uh, in Spain. I don't know in Portugal, but in Spain it's not possible. But yes, 
the 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 answer is yes it's it's a an added value value for the producers that have the possibility to receive the, this money and this uh, payment yes absolutely if not directly at least indirectly um biodiversity helps and it it's uh, part of the ecosystem and it brings value as a natural capital and bringing new solutions into the system uh, Manuel, how do you assess the impact of this code of good practices? How do you assess the impact of implementation? Uh, well, I, until now, we haven't uh, started to measure the implementation of this code of practices. Uh, because, uh, as I mentioned before, in 2021, we mm -hmm. uh, performed a, a survey in order to know what are what were the the common practices in different aspects in, in different aspects related with a uh, manage manual management uh, pasture use uh, some uh, feeding uh, uh, feeding practices etc and we uh, we are going to perform a new survey in the coming in the coming uh, years, probably uh, in the framework of a European uh, research project. And uh, with this tool, we could measure what is the impact of the implementation of this uh, code of good practices. Yes, of course, and I have an idea of uh, how uh, do you started and where the implementation is uh, letting them go. Um, a curiosity, is this code available uh, available for free so for download in your website? Amazing. Well, it's, it's in Spanish. We have a, a summary in, in English. In English, but, uh, yeah. I, I'm sure you are going to understand the Spanish because we share more stuff. At least for the, the Portuguese participants, that would be um, a little bit more easier. Um, and the last question, how do you transfer the knowledge of the code to the farmers, for yes. instance? Or for example, do you realize um, some webinars? Uh, some sessions to, to help them know a little bit more about these practices that you selected? Yes, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we perform a, a transfer process. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, perform a webinar uh, after the, the releasing of the code of practices. Uh, and at the same time, we propose the Ministry of Agriculture to uh, establish the same the webinar for technicians in the two cases, because in our experience, the producers uh, don't uh, be available to hear uh, and to attend this kind of webinars uh, in 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 a good in, in a green number, we can convince some of the producers, but the the most uh, successful way to uh, introduce these measurements uh, these measures to the producers is the direct contact between the technician and the the farmer. The farmer uh, attend uh, for the farmer attending a, a meeting like this, that that. Uh, takes uh, one or two hours is difficult. And especially if the, the message you are going to send them uh, in some aspects is, is complicated for, for them. Yes, thank you so much for your um, for your presentation, for your talk, Manuel, for, for enlightening us in the in the Q&A we'll, with all of these questions that we had for you. Um, having this code, to, to achieve climate neutrality in the beef cattle sector is uh, is a very interesting way, and it's um, a very a very good way to have this data available for farmers, for processors, and so on. So I congratulate you for the great work that uh, you have done. Um, so aligned with these thoughts, I have a question for all of the speakers that I have here with me. I would kindly ask you for your perspective on it. And my question is, what strategy would you choose to move towards a more climate farming livestock production process? If you had to choose one strategy, what, which one 
would be the strategy that you would put first in place? And probably I will start with Manuel. Well, uh, in my opinion, there are two possibilities, uh, two ways. The first one is to uh, advise them that uh, trying to reduce the emissions, they are gaining inefficiency. They are uh, uh, obtaining more um, more benefit for the same investment. This is the first mm -hmm. uh, uh, possibility. And the second one is uh, to move them uh, because the uh, the consumers and not the consumers but the the companies that uh, buy uh, their products are willing to pay more for the product that incorporates some of uh, some differentiation on in, in this subject if the uh, the retail uh, companies pay more to the farmers that have started to reduce the uh, greenhouse gas emissions or the or, or, or the environmental footprint in general, mm -hmm. uh, they will change the, the 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 way they are doing things. But these are these are the uh, the two perspectives in my opinion because the two of them are related with the the benefit the producers receive for doing things. In the in the right way in the, the right way yes absolutely and all of this is interconnected it's absolutely no way of stacking them into uh, boxes um for you professor uh, jose i ask what strategy would you choose if you have to move towards a more climate farming livestock if you have yes, if uh, you had to choose mm -hmm. one to start would you go with uh, including these legumes into forage Introducing the pine trees into your uh, silvopastry systems. Right. Um, yeah, there are many, many different options, and I think all of them are important. But I think if I need to pick one, and if you're serious about the, the carbon neutrality, I think planting a small portion of trees mm -hmm. at the farm would would be probably the the most successful Beneficial. way to to mitigate the, those emissions because yeah, the legumes, the, the diets and everything helps, but uh, I think the sequestration from the trees will be helping. It doesn't need to be civil pasture systems. It could be like a small portion of the farm that you, you know, just plant trees in that area. Um, at least from the data that I've seen, mm -hmm. that's the most effective way to offset. I mean, the emissions will be there, but at least you're trying to of offset. Course. Yeah. Yes, a way to reach sustainability. And Professor Diwakar? Yeah, I think uh, as mentioned earlier, there are so many strategies, right? And sometimes it is difficult because all of these strategies work in in combination with each other. But uh, if I have to pick a strategy, I would want uh, that strategy not only reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, but also improve the profitability for the producers. And if I think on those lines for the cow calf operations or the beef production systems, I think the grazing management uh, um, uh, is, 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 is on, on top of the list for me because we, uh, that not only gives us how we are using the land, but it also helps us in increasing the forage quality that can has the potential to improve the performance of these animals. And if I think about the intensive dairy operations, I can see that uh, manure management is, is, is uh, something on the top of my list because uh, there's a huge scope uh, considering the amount of manure that is being generated from these operations. So that, that's the two strategies that I would pick. Thank you so much, Professor Diwakar. Dear speakers, thank you so much for your presence. We have learned a lot from you today. Uh, let's hope that these strategies and these mechanisms shared here today can be more widespread and available for, for application. So our time has arrived. It was really a pleasure to be moderating this webinar today, and I thank you all for participating. Before we close the webinar, let me remind you that we will continue this series next week, and we will address the topic of natural sources for low emissions in ruminants. I hope you can join us next week, same day, same time. We'll be here for another interesting session. Thank you so much and see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.